So you probably clicked on this video thinking, there is no way there is a fact about every single Splatfest theme in the Splatoon series. Well, there is. And that's why I'm making this video. From the most well-known Splatfest to the least, here is at least one fact for every single Splatfest theme in all three Splatoon games. I'll be going in chronological order starting from the first game, Splatoon for the Wii U. The Splatfest did not contain Versus Self at all, as it wasn't implemented until version 1.3.0. This Splatfest was delayed to add in said Versus Self in version 1.3.0. It was delayed until July 4th. The original date of the Splatfest was going to be on June 20th, 2015. For the first ever trailer of Splatfest, Team Rock was the first key you could see in the video. Trust me, I had nothing else to say about this one. The theme of this Splatfest reflects the large fox and Tanuki statues found in Ethopolis Plaza. According to the wiki, about halfway through the Splatfest, the colors became randomized for a few matches before returning to normal. This was probably a mistake on the wiki, as the person writing this may have gotten it mixed up with versus self colors, since I couldn't find any evidence of this odd event occurring. So far, this is the only Splatfest where the orange team won in an orange versus purple Splatfest. Had the wins percentage been higher though, like in later updates, then Team Sleep would have won regardless. This is the first and only Splatfest in Splatoon 1 to feature white ink. This is the first Splatfest in the version 2.0 update, meaning it was the first Splatfest with the wins percentage raised to times 4, which ironically did not change the outcome of this particular Splatfest. This had the closest point score in Europe, with a 12 point difference. This was the first time where the MVP list, top 5, of the Splatfest included players using Charger class weapons, with Team Grasshopper having 3 out of 5 people using a Charger. Man, that was so hard to come up with something for this one, goddamn dude. The colors for the Splatfest were mistakenly used in League Battles a few days before the Splatfest took place. The colors for this Splatfest were also mistakenly used in League Battles. This was the first winning Splatfest team with a 51% win rate. This was the first Splatfest to have both a 51% win rate and a 51% popularity rate. It was also the only Splatfest in Splatoon 1 to have this instance occur. This Splatfest is similar to Chaos vs. Order in Splatoon 2. In fact, the German localization's team names are the same as those of Chaos vs. Order from Splatoon 2. Other localizations also use their local equivalent of the word Order for Team Tidy. Had the wins percentage been at time 6 for this Splatfest, the Team Octopus would have been the winner. Once again, Team Octopus being robbed of a victory. This was the closest Splatfest in North America, with only a 4 point difference. This is the first instance of a repeat Splatfest. This was also the first time where a region took a theme from another region in the past. This was the closest Splatfest with the wins percent times 6 era, with a score difference of only 6 points. Yes, I know when Splatfest power was introduced it was still times 6 wins, but I'm talking about the era itself of only times 6 percent wins. This is the first Splatfest where a team had over 70 percent popularity. This was the first truly Halloween themed Splatfest. You could argue that Pirates vs Ninjas was kinda like Halloween costumes, but this one is more Halloween themed. This is the first Splatfest to have IRL Splatfest tees. Apparently this Splatfest along with previous Splatfest Marshmallows vs Hot Dogs and Roller Coasters vs Water Slides had a scrapped Japanese Splatfest, Western Japan vs Eastern Japan, contained in the data for these Splatfests. This particular Splatfest was the last time to include such data. This was the only European Splatfest to feature Museum del Foncino. Sad. Had the wins percentage not been changed from times 2, then this Splatfest would have ended in a tie. This Splatfest had the highest even split percentage between both categories, with Team Nice having 59% popularity and Team Naughty having an equal 59% in wins. This Splatfest also would have ended in a tie if they didn't change the wins percentage from times 2. Once again, this Splatfest would have ended in a tie if they didn't change the wins percentage from times 2. Man, they got lucky that this never happened. Callie previously mentioned in the Art vs Science Splatfest dialogue that she likes to draw dinosaurs, similar to the dinosaurs for Team Past. This is only referenced in the Spanish dialogue, however. This Splatfest had the highest popularity vote of all time, with a staggering 77% vote. Unsurprisingly, they still lost. Splatoon 1 Splatfest moment. This Splatfest was the only Splatfest where a team got more than 60% win rate, with Team Pokemon Green getting a 64% win rate. This also means it's the biggest point difference in all of Splatoon's Splatfest, with an insane 146 point difference. Despite both North America and Europe sharing the same theme, 
The stages were oddly still different. The only difference is Europe got Hammerhead Bridge while North America got Anchovy Games. Of course, this means that the two regions share different results since they were technically two unique Splatfests. Considering this was the first set of Splatfests to have the top 100, this means that the first ever 2500 Splatfest power achieved was on Team Go All Out by... Uh, yeah, I can't read Japanese. Ironic, as the next Splatfest in Japan, this record would be beaten by 167 points with 2762 power. So this was one of, if not the only Splatfest in Splatoon 1 to be announced in-game before on social media. This also happened a few times in Splatoon 2, where I got to do live theme reactions, which is something that will likely never happen again. Splatfest theme is... What? This Splatfest had the lowest top 5 in Splatoon 1, with first place getting only 1960 and 1932 power for both teams respectively. About 790,000 players in Japan participated in the Splatfest, which set a new record. And considering about 1.5 million units sold at the time, this means more than half of the player base in Japan played in this particular Splatfest. This was the first ever Splatfest to have combined regions facing each other. The Pokemon ones were separate regions. And also, this is the first ever Splatfest to last more than 24 hours, this time lasting 30 hours. This was the first ever global Splatfest, and the only truly global Splatfest, since this is the only time all three regions were faced against each other, meaning most matches you would be facing Japanese players. As a result, most of the top 100 has Japanese players, which is pretty funny. This Splatfest had the closest score in all of Splatoon Splatfest history, with only two points of difference. Talk about competitive. The top 100 image used in the Splatfest used the wrong colors. As you can see, the early bird color is purple, and the night owl color is orange, when they should have been switched around. Oops. The Splatfest shared the exact same results as Hoverboard vs. Jetpack, another European Splatfest. I have a lot of things to say, but I'll only state the more interesting facts. The Splatfest wasn't originally planned to be the final Splatfest. It was only because the fans had a great reaction. A great reaction to, I'm assuming, Callie and Marie in general. The development of Splatoon 2 had started when the Callie vs. Marie Splatfest was taking place, as the result of the Splatfest affected how the story of Splatoon 2 would play out. Instead of, I'm Team Callie and I'm Team Marie, they originally thought to word it as, your choice will change the next Splatoon, but decided against it as the sequel had not been announced. This was the first and only time where Japan took a theme from another region in the past. This Splatfest had the highest popularity winning team to date, with an astonishing 76% vote. This was the only global, but separated Splatfest in Splatoon 2. This technically means each region's Mayo vs. Ketchup was a unique and different Splatfest. Also as a bonus, had the results not been segregated but instead merged, Ketchup would have been the winner based on the data pulled from Splatnet 2. This Splatfest had the most popular team in any Japanese Splatfest to date, with a 71.42% vote for Team Fries. They still lost, however. This had the closest popularity vote in all of Splatoon 2 Splatfests, with a difference of 7,538 votes, or 1.48%. The Splatfest tees for this Splatfest had the team name switched by accident, with Dexterity's tee reading Endurance, and the Endurance T is reading instant, meaning instant power, a more literal translation of the Japanese text for the Dexterity team. Also, this was the only Splatfest to not feature a victory screenshot. You know, the screenshots they always share of the winning team trumping the losing team? Yep, no victory screen was made for this one, instead opting to show the in-game results instead. Probably forgot. In Octo Expansion, Pearl makes a reference to the Splatfest only in the Latin American Spanish localization, saying, Werewolves can't keep up with vampires. This was said during the rap portion between Pearl and Cuttlefish for context. This Splatfest had the lowest top 100 score in all of Splatoon 2 Splatfest, with last place on Team Backroll having only 2297 power. With the solo and team wins combined, this was the closest Splatfest in Japan percentage-wise, with a total of 0.2% of difference, 50.11% in solo and 50.09% in teams. First place on Team Sci-Fi was removed due to an inappropriate nickname. I won't show the full name here, but you can find a link to the screenshot in the description if you wish to see it for yourself. Due to the results being able to be data mined through Splatnet 2, we know this particular Splatfest only had 131,239 participants, 
meaning this is the least attended Splatfest in Splatoon 2. Sadly, after January 2018, Nintendo hid the exact results in Splatnet 2, so we couldn't retrieve any more. But considering the Switch started selling more and more units in the future, this fact about the least attended Splatfest is likely still true. This Splatfest had the closest split overall in Japan, with Team Innerwear having a 50.35% win rate in solo, and Team Outerwear having a 50.20 win rate in teams. Again, this is the closest split. Earlier I mentioned that Lemon vs. No Lemon had closer, but that wasn't a split. They got both categories, unlike this one. Pearl and Marina's icons on the theme are swapped. As you can see, their icons are on the other themes as normal, but this one isn't. This is likely because the lore is that Pearl got socks from Marina, and Marina got a sweater for Pearl for Christmas. And as you can tell in the artwork, they don't look very pleased with their gifts. This Swafus was the first time ever that someone outside of Japan reached 2700 Swafus power, with first place on Team Book having achieved 2719 by Plantro. According to the data, this was the most attended Swafus in Splatoon 2, with 2,075,407 participants. Though, seeing as this was the last Splatfest where the results were able to be data mined, this fact is very outdated, and I am 99% sure, say, Chaos vs. Order, the final Splatfest, had more participants than this one. In terms of a split result, this Splatfest had the lowest percentage win rate in any category, with Team Challenger having a 50.09% win rate in teams. This was the first and only time where North America took a theme from another region in the past. Only this time, they switched the teams around, likely to cater more towards Pearl and Marina's personalities. Apparently there were server maintenance during the Splatfest. This is the only known instance that I know of this happening. Or Europe. This Splatfest had a lighting glitch on the Gobi Arena stage, making the colors really bright and hard to see. The Splatfest took place a week before Chicken vs Egg, meaning Gobi Arena was not present in that Splatfest until next month when the glitch was fixed. This Splatfest had the highest team win percentage out of all Splatfests, with Team Chicken having a 56.30% win rate in teams. This is also the best overall team pre cloud era, with 52.66% in solo wins as well. But here's a 2 for 1. This Splatfest, as well as newest model versus popular model, shared almost the exact same popularity percentages, with Team Soccer having 59.99% in votes, and newest model having 59.95% in votes. In terms of wins, Team Salty is the best overall European exclusive team pre cloud era, with 51.73% in solo and 53.93% in teams, for a total of 105.66%. This Splatfest was the first time where Marina won all three categories. Previously, only Pearl's team won all three categories in two other Splatfests. This was the first Splatfest where a Shifty Station was reused, although it's a revamped version of an older Shifty Station. This was the first Japanese Splatfest in Splatoon 2 to feature White Ink. This is Marina's best Splatfest in terms of win rate pre cloud era, with 52.36% in solo wins and 54.82% in team wins for Team Donnie. This Splatfest was the only time until Chaos vs. Order where a revamped version of Windmill House on the Pearly Shifty Station was playable. The colors for this particular Splatfest cannot be selected in private battles, which is a shame considering they changed the Donnie color to a slightly brighter purple, likely to complement the red Raph color. Just like Raph vs Donnie, this particular color combo cannot be selected in private battles. Unfortunate, as this is one of the best color combos in any Splatfest. Reminds me of those circus animal cookies. This Splatfest had the most popular team in a merged North American and Europe Splatfest to lose with Team No Pulp having 67.35% in votes, yet still losing the Splatfest. This Splatfest was the only time where a player could play as an Octoling in Splatoon 2 without having beaten Octo Expansion, and only if they picked Team Octopus. Marina makes a statement at the end of the Splatfest saying how she's lost three Splatfests in a row. Ironic is after this Splatfest with the new changes, Marina would go on to win seven Splatfests in a row in Europe. But still, in North America, Pearl only won one of those Splatfests with Salsa vs. Glock. What a comeback. This Splatfest ending dialogue makes a reference to Splatfest Law, with Pearl saying, You'll survive, and Splatfest Law says you can't complain about it either. First place on Team Bamboo Shoot Village was removed from Splatnet 2 for unknown reasons. Once again, first place on this Splatfest was removed from Splatnet 2 and were marked as Cheater, although this is the last time someone's name was removed from the top 100. It's funny how two of these instances happened right after each other in different regions. 
This life has started on a Sunday instead of the usual Saturday because it coincided with the Japanese moon viewing festival, which is why you can see a bright full moon during this Splatfest. As a bonus, the same full moon can be seen in Retro vs. Modern. So remember that full moon from a few seconds ago? Yep, it's back in this Splatfest. Most likely was left in to help with the Splatoween aesthetic. In private battles, much like any other Japanese themes, the names were renamed to basic colors, deck tint red versus tasty white. However, in Spanish, German, Italian, French, and Russian languages, the name Paki vs. Paki Gokuboso is used instead. This Swafest had the best 3-0 sweep in any North American exclusive Swafest, with Team Salsa having a total of 163.59% combined with votes, normal clout, and pro clout. Sheldon makes a reference to the Swafest in Splatoon 3, with his introduction speech of the Splattershot Nova. He says towards the end, if you like to save the tastiest looking bite of food for last, give this loadout a try. And stop doing that. It'll taste better at the start of the meal. This indicates that Sheldon supports Team Eat It. So Animal Crossing New Leaf could have protected the Splatfest. When customizing the left Splatfest sign and right Splatfest sign items, one of the options for each is Hero Red and Villain Purple. Hmm. Well, considering all the other options are references to Splatoon 1 Splatfest, this is really just a reference to Autobots vs Decepticons. But it's still interesting the similarity considering these items weren't added to the game until late 2016. The first instance of the Splatfest being publicly shown was in a commercial for the Nintendo Switch for the holidays uploaded by Nintendo Online in Japanese, before the event's announcement later that day. Also as a bonus, the T's on the commercial show Trick and Treat instead of the correct names. How embarrassing. Chapter 31 of the Splatoon manga features the Splatfest, with goggles, bobblehead, gloves, and eight on Team Bokeh, and specs, headphones, prens, and skull on Team Sukomi. Also in the English translation, it's translated as Funny Man vs. Straight Man. This Splatfest was the only time in Splatoon 2 where all three categories rounded down to 51%, much similar to the Art vs. Science Splatfest in Splatoon 1. If you played in this Splatfest, you may have noticed the intro card had a special design. Well, that same one would go on to be used in the Springfest event. So what's up with that? Likely it was just put in for fun, as a hint to the event, as it's very unlikely this would have gone unnoticed. For the first time, Pearl and Marina were wearing their Octo expansion outfits in-game. Previously, every now and then they only wore it in the official artwork. So according to the results dialogue, Pearl apparently owns an entire league, with Marina saying, Speaking of which, doesn't Pearl Senpai's family own a baseball team? To which Pearl responds, Hmm? We don't own a team, but the Inkopolis Princess League is ours. Pearl is quite powerful in the Splatoon universe, huh? This is the first time where a space-related team won a Splatfest. Previously, anytime there was a theme that had to do with space or futuristic elements, that team always lost. Until this one. The team names for this Splatfest were switched by accident in private battles. Listing it as pineapple slash no pineapple, this is forgivable as every other Splatfest where I ask if you prefer something or not, it always lists the pro version first and the not version second. The Team Narwhal Splatfest tee for some reason had Pearl's icon instead of Marina's. You can see Marina's icon on other Splatfest tees, but not this one. This one was actually found by me. Yeah, back then I was a Splatfest nerd. Still am by making this silly video. Team Grown Up had the highest pro clout percentage out of any Splatfest in Splatoon 2, with a 54.73% in pro mode clout. During the announcement of the Splatfest, the music changes midway through to The Plan from Octo Expansion. This was the first ever time the music BGM changed during the newscast. So if you look at the results of the Splatfest, they are very similar to the combined results of the original Mayo vs. Ketchup. History really is repeating itself here. This is the first time someone achieved 3,000 Splatfest power in Splatoon 2, with first place on Team Egg having gotten 3,024. GG's bro. The Egg is proud. The original Trick vs. Treat from 2018 featured a unique sound effect when pressing ZL plus ZR on the title screen, just like every other event Splatfest. During this one, however, there was just silence. Likely just a mistake, but still, pretty spooky. Team Super Mushroom has the highest normal clout percentage out of any Splatoon 2 Splatfest, 
with 53.41%. This also means that overall, Team Super Mushroom is the best Splatfest team in terms of clout, with 53.41% in normal clout and 54.12% in pro clout. This is the first time where Europe started first in a global Splatfest event. Previously, only Japan or North America started before anyone else if the start times were different. Due to a bug, if a player did not select a team and started collecting con shells, then the shells would disappear from their inventory. The only way to prevent this from happening is to pick a team, then start getting con shells. This was an oversight because normally you cannot start collecting con shells until you pick a team first. Team Grass's color was supposed to look different for the Splatfest. This is what it was going to look like, but due to a bug, it went unused. It was speculated that the game may have prioritized a copy of the old colors that was mistakenly added in the 1.2.0 update. This is unconfirmed, however. This is the first time someone achieved 3000 Splatfest power in Splatoon 3. With first place in Japan on Team Spicy having gotten 3005 power by IGZ underscore Melon. This is the first time where a team achieved a final score of 57 points, which is currently the highest amount of points a team could gain after a Splatfest. This is truly a big man sweep. This Splatfest had the closest popularity vote so far in Splatoon 3, as well as the entire series, with Team Nessie and Aliens only having a difference of 0.87%. This Splatfest also has the lowest scoring popularity vote in the entire series, with Team Bigfoot only having 8.69% in votes. This Splatfest had near identical percentages for the halftime score and open score. If you didn't know, as of this video, the halftime report takes the open scores into account, and the difference between the halftime score and the open score for Team Power was only 0.01%. That's just insane, honestly. According to the Inkypedia, the names of the teams are missing in the top 100 list of Europe. What? I'm assuming it's referring to the names of the teams at the top of the page of the top 100 list in SWATnet 3? I tried searching for this already online, but to no avail. So, uh, if anyone lives in Europe and has SWATnet 3, check this particular SWATfest top 100 list and see if this error is still present. I'd love to know. Although by this point I bet this has been fixed. I still wanted to include this weird and mysterious fact though. As of this video, Team Fame has the highest pro clout out of any Splatfest in Splatoon 3, with 36.96% in pro mode. And now, for the final fact of this video. Did you know that this Splatfest, Shiver vs Fry vs Big Man, is the 100th Splatfest theme? Yep, this is the 100th unique Splatfest theme, and I counted all the Splatfest in all three Splatoon games. In Splatoon 1, there were 40 unique themes, with two themes being reused. In Splatoon 2, there were 50 unique themes, with four themes being reused from Splatoon 1, and three being rematched Splatfest. And in Splatoon 3, this Splatfest is the 10th Splatfest, including the demo Splatfest. Therefore, this is the 100th Splatfest theme. There are some arguments you can make about this, like Squid vs Octopus from Splatoon 1 to Splatoon 2, but to reference myself in the Iceberg video... Now you could argue that Squid vs Octopus is also repeated from Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2, but in Splatoon 1's case, that Splatfest was about the food, and in Splatoon 2, it's about the species Inklings and Octolings. I don't count Money vs Love in Splatoon 2 because that's just Love vs Money but reverse. But I still count Money vs Fame vs Love in Splatoon 3 because they added Fame as an option, which makes it unique in my opinion. And finally, you could argue that the Tournament Final Round Swafas shouldn't count because they're just reused teams. But I still count them as unique because we never saw Raph vs Donnie or Hello Kitty vs My Melody before, only the previous team's Swafas rounds. So using all this logic, Shiver vs Fry vs Big Man is the 100th Swafas theme. Whew. And there you have it. One fact for every Splatfest theme. If you watched till the end, then thank you. This video took longer than I expected, honestly. And you could tell some Splatfest I was really stretching for a fact, but hey, I did it. 
and I honestly couldn't have done it without the Splatoon Wikipedia for Splatfest. They list trivia for almost every Splatfest, and most facts I wouldn't have known about without it. So thank you to all the Splatoon Wiki editors for contributing to this topic. And on that note, thanks for watching and listening to me talk about Splatfest for 20 minutes. Goodbye.